call me. My name is Mary, Pastor Mary. You don't have to call me that, though. You can just call, you just call me Mary. It's weird otherwise. Um, but welcome in. It says it on the thing, though, you know. So um, I, uh, gosh, okay. I don't know how this is going to go today. We're just going to go Jesus. Um, I'm going to pray. So Lord God, thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you for this church and these people who who you love so dearly, God, and so, know so intimately. And we just pray your blessings this morning, God. We just pray that you uh, meet us here, God, and that we can come forward and just meet with you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so how's everybody doing today? <laughs> Yes. Okay. I feel like, as Adam, you don't have to raise your hand, but is if anybody's here feeling like tired or worn out or just kind of like at the end of your rope, I mean, I feel like pretty much everybody that I've talked to lately has just been like feeling this heaviness. And if you're not, amen. <laughs> right, Tommy? Amen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just feel like, oh, gosh, we have so much going on in our lives constantly and we have, you know, work and family and, and, and stresses and, and money things, every, I don't know, kids, everything. Just there's so much coming at us all the time. And it's so hard to not feel burnt out. Um, and okay, so basically this, this sermon, just so, just so I can preface it, is really what God's put on my heart this last week. I feel like he has not only put this on my heart to speak, but he has challenged me in it this week. It has been challenging week for me. Um, but anyway, so as we're going through the, through life, like things are really heavy and, and it's, it is hard, especially when we're trying to do it on our own. Um, and basically that's what I'm talking about today. I'm going to go straight to the word because that's, I think, where we're going to just get started. So um, we're going to open your Bibles or your Bible app if you want. We're going to be in John 15 uh, when we're starting in verse 1. So he says, this is Jesus talking, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch. Oh, sorry, I should have waited for you guys. I'm sorry. Flip your Bibles. You can get there. Sorry. I heard some actual pages turning. Okay, I'm going to start over. John 15. <laughs> I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. Jesus is the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So we'll come back to that first part in a little bit, but I really want to focus on verse four and five. So what he's saying here is to remain in him. And I love the dictionary because I'm such a nerd. So I looked it up because I'm like, what does it say in the dictionary? Because that's what I learned in school. I don't know if you guys had multiple dictionaries. I did. Um, and it said remain in the, in the dictionary says to stay in the same place or position or to continue unchanged. We're called to stay, remain in Christ. And when we become Christians, we have this moment, like I think most people, you go and you say this prayer and you say, Jesus, please come into my heart, right? That's like the term. But really what we're saying is we're asking Jesus to come be a part of our life. And at the same time, we're making a covenant to step forward into Jesus, right? And we know that the Bible says that Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us. So when you ask Jesus to come be a part of your life, he's there. He's not going anywhere. And just like Rod said this morning, he'll even come get you. But we're the ones who wander. We're the ones who walk away or go do our own things. We step out of that covenant that we made with Christ to be in him, right, for other things or for other reasons. But we are called to stay and remain in Christ. And when we do that, it says that we'll bear much fruit, that things, everything else will flow. And we can't do it on our own strength. Otherwise, if we do... Everything we're doing, even if they're good things, can either come from a selfish place or it's going to wear you down. It's going to make you tired. And sorry, I need to flip that. Okay. And I think everybody knows this kind of, you've probably heard this verse before, um, but it's still hard for us sometimes to remain in Jesus. So I made, <laughs> I made some visuals uh, in paint on the computer. I am not a graphic designer, so just don't judge the visuals, okay? So 
All right. <laughs> Now you will. Just don't look. There's lots of mistakes. I know. Don't worry about it. Anyway, so the very first thing that uh, reason or thing that we do to not remain in Jesus, and you can put that first one up there, um, we try to do it all by ourselves. And this is us. Yeah, I did make this. Thank you. If you want to buy it from me later, you can. <laughs> Super good, right? <laughs> Anyways, but this is us, this little stick figure. You just pretend it's you. Um, and we're, we're trying to push it up a hill because culture tells us we are strong and we're independent. And we can do whatever we want on our own strength. All we have to do is just try really hard. And this is what we look like. And no matter what, even if you get some, some leeway, you're always pushing and it's heavy, right? That rock is like bigger than that person. It's going to, you know, you know, science, you could tell it's not going to work eventually the person is going to get crushed or just exhausted. And then the next thing that we do is sometimes we fight with the Lord. So you can go to the next one. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you knew that that was Jesus. <laughs> um, we fight with the Lord. So we think that we know better. So maybe the Lord tells us something and we're like, okay, but I don't want to do that. And so we're pushing against him, but ultimately he's the king and he's stronger. So you're not going to go anywhere. It's just going to wear you out to push against the Lord's will. And sometimes we do that unknowingly. Sometimes we don't ask the Lord. So we don't know that it's against his will. I always, <laughs> the biggest example I like to use is like youth group kids. So many times have come up to me and been like, God just told me that I need to date this person. And I'm like, did he really tell you that? And so many times there's like heartbreak and all this horrible stuff. And they're like, I, I shouldn't have done that. And I'm all, was that you? Um, but we do this in life all the time. Sometimes God will tell us something and we think we know better. We just do. And we'll push against him. And then the third thing we do is sometimes we go alongside Jesus. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is an above view, just so you all know. So you're on the same side as Jesus, right? We're on the same side as Jesus, but we're kind of trying to help him push our life rock along. So it's like this. Um, Ivy in the grocery store. It's so funny that you use the grocery store analogy. Um, we went shopping that same trip and Ivy, of course, no longer wants to sit in the cart. She's two. She wants to help me push the cart. I tried to let her do it on her own and she almost crashed it into a display. So that, and it's like a giant cart. So I'm like, okay, you can help me push. But what happened is she's trying to push her own way and I'm trying to push the cart to go where we need to go. And she's pushing against me. So she's, I'm constantly, hey, no, this way, this way. And our cart is like wobbling side to side. And sometimes that's us in life. Like we're not necessarily doing the wrong thing, but we haven't surrendered all of it to God. We're not letting him take control. And so what that looks like is, is it's slow going through the grocery store with a two year old pushing a cart is slow. And it's like, I'm like come on. No, we're going to hit those bottles. We're going to hit this, you know, cheese it display. I don't want that constantly. So that's sometimes what we do. And in reality, it could be really easy. This is my last picture. So no worries. I didn't want to draw Jesus in the ex or the, it's not an excavator. It's a bulldozer. Blippy, come on. <laughs> anyway, all the toddler parents know what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, Jesus can take, he, all he has to do is he's got the ultimate machine and we can just hop right in, in the passenger seat and sit back and he'll push our life along. And it doesn't mean that life is easy, but it's easier, right? If we let Jesus take control, we can rest in peace. We're going the right direction. No backseat driving though in our excavator. Oh no. Bulldozer. Okay. So anyways, my, I know that was silly. I'm sorry, but back to what I was saying, what we know is the Bible says in Matthew 11:30, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. We make things in life feel heavier than they are, right? We, we, we make it harder than it has to be. We're over here. If you're feeling like you're just pushing a rock up a hill and nothing's coming of it and you're just tired and worn out, it's time to check and see, are you really remaining in God? Are you really yielding that fruit from the spirit? We'll get there. I'm going to get ahead of myself. But anyways, what, what does it look like to remain? So remaining, and I, I love this because it's totally preaching to myself, but remaining doesn't mean we just wake up and start our day in prayer. It doesn't mean just an hour of Bible study, which is great. I encourage everybody to spend time in their word, but remaining means you take Jesus with you everywhere you go, you remain in him, right? It's like having a best friend on speed dial. All you have to do, anything you do, include him in every decision. 
You can trust him in every situation. You can ask him, should I do this or that in every situation? Even down to the smallest thing is like, should I stop and get coffee this morning? He told me no on that the other day, by the way. No, I can't stop it. I was like, why? <laughs> I was, I, oh, I did. And I was, and th- while I'm writing this sermon, much less like, and I'm like, why? I love coffee. And he's like, no, not right now. I'm like, okay. And I don't know, I probably would have crashed and my day was really, really, lo- not crashed my car. Caffeine crashed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, so I don't know, but so you can include him in the smallest things. And I think the thing is, once we stop battling him, it gets a lot less exhausting. If you're going to ask God for what he wants us to do, you better listen when he responds, right? Otherwise, we're that person pushing against the rock. Yes, we know God's will, but we're still going to fight and it's still going to be exhausting. And here's the cool thing. He really does care about you. He cares like... We have this intimate God, and that's what you're saying. He knows us intimately, deeply. It says he knows the hairs on our head. This morning when I was brushing my hair, I lost like, I don't know, 40 hairs. And I thought like, he probably still knows how many hairs on my head, right? Like, I don't even know how many hairs I lost after I brushed my hair. God knows you intimately and he cares about the intimate details. And if you ask him, it's not like he's going to be like, okay, Tommy, what do you want now? What is today? No, he's going to be like, okay, my son is coming to me, right? So here's the thing. I'm going to write this sermon and I hit this total wall and I'm like done. And I was tired and it was a Thursday, no, Friday, Friday. And I hadn't written much of anything at all. I tried Friday morning. Nothing was working. I went to babysit. I came home and I was like, Tommy, I don't know if I can do this. I'm just, can you, you know, I'm like, he loves to preach. Give him a microphone. He'll preach a sermon for you right now. Anywhere. He preaches everywhere we go. And so I thought in my head, Maybe Tommy will take this message. And he's like, no, God told me it's for you to preach this week. And I was like, darn it. (laughs) So I was like cranky and I went upstairs and I laid down and I just fell asleep because I was so worn out. It's been a crazy week and I passed out and then I wake up and I'm like, okay, God, what do I do? And all of a sudden he just starts giving me things, verses and and things to say. and, And I'm like, okay. And so I start writing it and I'm like, man, I didn't trust God. I wasn't exactly what I was trying to write out that morning. I wasn't remaining in God and trusting he had a plan for me. I was trying to do it on my own strength and write stuff out on my own. Okay, so here's the cool thing. So I'm like, I wake up, I'm starting to write stuff down and I go to my Bible app, pull it up to uh, see, try to find my verse, my title verse. And then this is what was on my Bible app. I screenshot it and put it up here. Yeah, now the one before that, that one, it's okay. And it's, this was on there and it said, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord. Your God will be with you wherever you go. And I was like, I hadn't been on my Bible app that day. I didn't know why I was like, maybe that was the verse of the day today. And that's why it was there. But I was like, that's cool. I guess like that's something encouraging. That's what I needed to hear. So I was like, it's the verse of the day though. That's why it's there. So I clicked out to go find my verse. And then this verse is the verse of the day. The next one. This pops up, and this was actually the verse of the day. And it said, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And I'm all, if that wasn't for me, I don't know what was. And I'm all, that was the, I don't even know why the other verse was up there, but both of them, God sent me in that moment where I was feeling discouraged and like I couldn't do it on my own strength. He's like, I got you. And that's how much he cares about us because he wants good things for us. And that's what it said in our title verse there. It said, you know, he, he wants us to bear good fruit. He wants us to have good things. But all we have to do, it's simple. All we have to do is stay with him, like our inside companion. Um, so here's the thing about being a part of this. I, I know it says vine. I just like to think of it as a tree. It's just a little bit easier. Um, what we have to remember is that When we're a part of the family, it does say, and that's those first verses, I'll read them. Um, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I was like, okay, so yeah, what that's saying there is if we're remaining in him, if we're actually listening to what God has for us, that means sometimes things are going to get cut off, right? Sometimes doors are going to close, opportunities are not going to come. Or there's maybe a relationship, it's 11-11, a relationship that we have to um, 
you know, end or whatever it is. So I'm like, okay, I, uh, I'm just going to look up why trimming and pruning trees is necessary. I know that it is, but I, again, I like definitions. So I literally Googled it. This is what I found. I'm going to read it because I know it's small. And take in mind this as our metaphor here. Why is trimming and pruning necessary? Um, you may start noticing that trees on your property have limbs or branches that stop producing leaves and look dead. This can happen because of damage or disease. Tree trimming can remove the dead branches, improve both health and appearance. In fact, regular tree pruning can help keep your tree healthy, strong, and looking its best even before the branches die off completely. For the sake of your safety and health of your tree, it is best to hire a professional tree service to handle the pruning. Okay, we already, I know, <laughs> we already saw that it said in there that Jesus and or Jesus is the vine, but God is the master pruner, right? And it said right there, it's, it's, it's for our own safety. Why is tree trimming necessary? I'll keep going. There are three reasons why it's important for you to have your tree pruned regularly, especially when it has dead branches and limbs. Dead tree limbs and branches are less stable and likely to fall. This may occur without warning and result in injury to you or a family member or damage to your home. If the tree branch is already dead when it falls, the insurance company may not cover the resulting damage. <laughs> it may assert that you failed your responsibility to prevent the accident by having a dead, not having it trimmed. Okay. I was reading that with the thought of us, right? When we don't allow those things to be trimmed, by the way, if you need a good tree trimming service, I know somebody. <laughs> I know you're all sitting there thinking it. The point is, if we're not allowing those things to get cut off, if we're holding on to it so tight, whatever it is, then it can cause damage to yourself. It can cause damage to the people around you, your home, right? We have to allow God to come in when he tells, when we're in him and he says, it's time to let go of this. If we don't, it could be bad for us, right? He knows and he knows he's the, he's the ultimate professional tree service, right? He knows how to keep you healthy and looking good and feeling good, right? Even when there's been damage or disease that comes in. And I know sometimes it can be hard to let go of things, but if we don't, that's like the diseased tree coming in. And, okay, so Jesus says in, this, in the verse here, he says, we should be bearing much fruit. So if your tree or you have a branch of yourself, a part of your life that isn't bearing fruit or it's got no fruit or, or it's got, you know, poisoned fruit, you have to cut it off because otherwise that disease is going to spread to the other areas of your life. That whatever it is, is going to start spreading. And as it spreads and a tree that gets overtaken by that disease does what? Dies. And then... We're going to find out what the Bible says about that. So let's look at verse six. It says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned or thrown in a wood chipper. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. This is to my father's glory that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That verse is heavy, okay? So what it's saying is when, when you let that affect you and you just become spiritually dead, well, we know, we talked about it last week. Hell is a real place. There are consequences for us not living a life with God. And we don't wanna be that. We don't wanna be that branch that withers and thrown away. What we wanna be is a branch that's bearing good fruit. And it says much fruit. So if you're feeling like you're looking at your life and you're bearing some good fruit, but it's like, meh, not a ton. It says much fruit when we remain in him. So what, and then what he says after that, which I love is he's like, if you're remaining in me, what does it say? If you remain in me and I remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. 
This is my to my father's glory. What that means is as we start aligning our life with Jesus and remaining in him, his will starts to become our will. And he wants to give us the things that we, he wants us to be fruitful, have wonderful lives. God loves us. He's not the kind of guy who's like, all right, have a boring life and then, you know, die and go to heaven. Like, that's not what he wants. He wants us to have fruitful lives with love and we'll get there, right? He wants those things for us. And so then he says, if you ask whatever you wish, he'll do it. He cares about us. He wants to know about your day to day. And then uh, verse nine here, it says, as the father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to have you come on up. But we know that the Father loves us, that Jesus loves us. It's written all throughout Scripture. Literally, the whole point of the Bible is that He loves us, right? And we're going to mess up, right? We try, we're human. We try as hard as we want, as we can, to remain and stay in Jesus. But sometimes we step out, right? The most important thing is to remember when we fall, when we step out, to step right back in. And he's always there. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He's always there to bring us right back to him. And the last thing I wanted to go over here is what he's commanding us at the very end. Love each other as I have loved you. We talked, Rod talked about this morning. Loving each other, we're humans. Our love is frail. It's fickle. It's, it's got, um, you know, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Conditions. Thank you. It's conditional. And so we can try our best to love others the right way. We can try to love our spouse, our friends. And sometimes it's easy to love people like the people who love us and make us feel good. It's easy to love them. It is hard to love somebody that you don't like. It's hard to love somebody that's mean and and rude. And that love doesn't mean that we lay down and let somebody walk over us and we, we just become a doormat. That love that he's asking us, commanding us, is to ask him, hey, Lord, give me your eyes for that person. Let me see them the way you do. And it's heavy when you see somebody the way Jesus does because he doesn't look at them and see their faults. He doesn't look at them and see that they're mean or bad. He sees who they were created to be, not who they're acting like. He sees who they really are. And you ask for that love, right? That's remaining in Christ. That's becoming Jesus is actually loving others, not because You're trying on your own strength because your own strength is going to fail. And it's going to be tiring to love those people. But loving them through Jesus. Abiding in him. And it's a big shift. I think the biggest thing about remaining in Jesus is you have to surrender yourself. And that's hard because we take ourselves really seriously. We think that we know it all. We think we've got the answer. So what it is is you say, Jesus not my will, your will. And when he tells you to do something, you do it because you want to please the Father. You want to remain in him. And he will not let you down. He's not going to tell you no to something that is is not going to be bad for you in the long run. Or he's not going to say yes to something that's going to hurt you in the long run. He loves you. He knows the plan. We need to stop thinking that we know more that God is outside of time. What do we see? We see this the here, the now, and maybe hopes and dreams for the future. He actually sees the future. If you believe what you believe, what we say we believe, that he's omnipresent and omnipotent and um, omniscient, that he knows everything, that he is everywhere, that he is all powerful, then you have to believe that he knows the plan for you. And when we remain in him, we no longer have to push that rock up a hill by ourselves because he's going to come up alongside you and say, I got this. I can help you. Just sit back and trust me. The other option other than the bulldozer was he'll carry you on his back and push that rock right up the hill. He's super strong. Promise. Life does not have to be something that you have to fight to get through. If you want that fruit, you want to bear the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you're missing one of those things, if you don't have peace in your life, if you don't have joy in your life or whatever it is, you feel like you're not gentle or whatever it is. If you're missing that, that's an area you've got to go to Jesus and say, I surrender this. We can't love others on our own. We can't be joyful on our own. 
That's him. That's fruit of being in the spirit with Jesus and letting him prune off those diseased things and letting him hold us and walk us to where he wants us to be in life. Our God knows everything. He's got your back. He really does. And all, all you have to do is put yourself down. And even if that's every moment of every day for a while, right? Start with, start with the first moment and you say, Jesus, make this day yours. And walk with him throughout the day. Ask him questions. It's amazing. The more you talk to him, the quicker you hear him. And then you just say like, Lord, should I get coffee at Starbucks today? No? Okay. Lord, should I go help this person? Right? We get into trouble when we start going and doing things, and even if they're good, because if we don't include him, we could go into a situation that we're not supposed to be in. Our job is to ask him and walk with him day to day, every moment, not just in those one hour, you know, Bible studies or 20 minute Bible studies, but with him constantly and asking him for, ask him. If you don't have joy, you say, Lord, give me your joy. Give me your love for this person. Give me that peace that passes understanding. And all you have to do is surrender yourself and let him take the lead. Stop pushing that rock against him. Stop going against him and just take your hands off. I know it's hard, it's scary, but you can do it. When I think